Great, thank you. My my bad. I was going to go in that order and then I switched. <laughs> um, over to you, Shane. Kia ora koutou, um, or Shane Harris. I, hope I work for Safe Network. I'm one of the managers there. Um, been there for a very, very long time. Safe Network works with um, people from as young as five, so children, adolescents and adults, uh, all of whom have been involved in some concerning or harmful sexual behaviour towards others. Um, we work in the harmful sexual behaviour or HSB sector. Great, thank you. And Catherine from Start, sorry. That's all right. He mihi mahana kia koutou rau. So um, thank you for welcoming us into your homes. So as the, the um, label says, I'm the clinical practice manager at START. And START is Christchurch based. And um, we work with all age groups who have experienced sexual harm, sexual violence, as well as um, offering community education and advocacy. So um, thanks for organising this, Miriam, and, and happy to be involved. Thank you for being here. And we wanted to really start today's presentation by checking in with all of you. Um, these are really unprecedented times, as Jacinda often is saying in her press releases, but and they are for also those who are supporting those in the community. And so we've got a little spectrum here, and I'll be launching the poll so you can actually let us know how you personally are doing. So it goes from red to um, to grey. So red is you're feeling totally overloaded, stressed, on edge. Um, orange is juggling a lot. Sorry, my polls are in the middle. Juggling many things, difficult to focus beyond main priorities and taking new information. Yellow is lots going on, but still managing okay. Green is feeling positive and balanced and have mental space to reflect, assess and be creative and try new things. Blue is feeling sadness, depression, grief, loss of control. And grey is listless, bored, unfulfilled and numb. So I'll give you a couple more seconds to fill all of that. Oh, it's quite interesting. Just out of curiosity, can the panelists see the poll or is it just me? Ah, oh, great. We're experimenting with new technology here, participants. We can see the questions, but there's a there's a lovely red thing at the bottom that says we can't vote. So uh, we can't we can't join with you on that. Oh, so we'll ask you directly to give us some feedback. Um, so we'll close the the poll in 10 seconds, just letting the last few people participate. Okay, so panelists, how would you where would you position yourself? We'll start off with Shane. My gosh, forever the optimist. Um, I'm actually in the green space, apart from being very, very lonely in my house. Um, uh, there is lots of space and uh, lots of mental space and physical space. I'm feeling really positive and I'm enjoying um, the space to um, slow down a little bit and actually see the work for what it is, um, which means supporting our staff, uh, ensuring that our clients are getting really uh, good service. And often we don't have the time to do that. So I really appreciate it. So very green. Great. Catherine from Start. Um, well, I'm, I suppose I move between. So I think that right now I'm feeling green. Um, but, you know, there are moments during the day where I might, maybe especially after spending four or five hours on Zoom, that I might move yellow, orange, you know, <laughs> move up the scale. Um, but, yeah, still able to notice, to, to appreciate the slowing down and, and the not having to, to drop my son at football four nights a week. So I'm just saying, you know, there are some silver linings. Yeah, thank you. I'm Catherine from Help. Uh, well, I'd like to be green, and I'm quite attracted to that bright yellow there, but I think probably I'm moving between yellow and orange. With a fair amount of most days, most work days, um, in the orange. And, you know, that might seem a little odd in a, what for many people is a slow down time, but in some ways it's been a speed up time um, mm -hmm. because there has been some new opportunities um, available to us and so trying to kind of participate in making the most of those new opportunities of different ways of working with government primarily um, so trying to do those and have more contact with staff that's more deliberate because there's no longer that meeting people in the hallway which actually um, does form quite a bit of our caring for each other normally so so yeah there's lots going on and um, I'm, I'm was very green until probably having to get ready for this webinar where I panicked a little bit last minute and felt a little bit more in the yellow and orange. Um, but 
Yeah, so in terms of our participants, 54% um, are in the yellow. Um, lots going on, but still managing um, well, managing okay. 30% you're in the green, so um, feeling that positive. And then we've got 1% in the red and blue, so feeling totally overloaded and um, feeling sadness and depression, and 2% in the feeling bored and unfulfilled, and 13% in the orange, which is juggling many things. So thank you everyone for sharing. I suppose it was just really wanting to check in with how you are all doing in these times um, and wanting to make sure everyone um, has an opportunity to also connect with each other and in these new unprecedented times. Um, just so that I see a few hands being raised um, through the participants, just to let you know, webinar functions do work quite differently. They don't actually allow you to speak. So if you're feeling that you can't be heard, um, these are some of ways those through the chat and the Q&A box of how you can really engage with us and through our polls. So um, let Becky know who's in the chat, working really, really hard, um, if we can help in any other way. So the next, we're going to go through a few little pieces of what the guidelines are and then we're going to really open it up to conversation. So gear up your questions and hopefully the next few slides will help direct our questions in a certain, to what's going to be useful for today. So the overview of the guidelines, um, really we, as a, as a national body, we found that there was a lot of information and sometimes very big documents. So we went through um, some of the guidelines either from the, you know, the various uh, registration bodies or um, various organisations, both here in New Zealand and one Australian, um, count, well, from the Australian Counselling Association. And thanks to one of our volunteers, who, who is Lily K. Ross, and some of our clinical advisors, we managed to put together about a five-page document. And hopefully Becky is sharing that link um, in the chat right now, where you can actually go and download the document um, for reference. And we also tried to give a specific sexual violence slant of really thinking through what are the specific needs of survivors and those with harmful sexual behaviour in this moment in time? What do we need to be thinking about um, to support them? So when, while we we're doing that, it just gave us a bit of an overview of this doc, of these guidelines, which is intended to provide guidance for those in offering therapeutic counsellor counselling to victim survivors of sexual and domestic violence during COVID-19 pandemic and it is more specifically to sexual violence an issue we're trying to do both but then we kept it to sexual violence and it offers some practical advice for maintaining productive therapeutic relationships supporting your clients well-being as best as possible during this specifically during lockdown because lots of the telehealth guidelines didn't have obviously a pandemic slant um, because that's not why they were developed. We're not going to go through all of the document, but I did want to highlight one of the things that I think is really important um, and is just really thinking about always our professional role and our professional practice within any context. And I'm reminding ourselves that first and foremost, for us to be supportive um, of others, we do need to put our um, oxygen mask on first and, um, and really think through how this pandemic is impacting us. Hence, we put that first question of actually pausing and going, how am I doing? How, how is my relationship to this new context that we're living in? And how does that then influence my practice in every day? Um, sometimes we also need to think about how do we, you know, what kind of aims are appropriate in therapy um, was part of the document. Actually, as always, and I'm sure all of you are already doing this, so sometimes it is a little bit preaching to the choir, is how do we put um, the client always at the centre of our practice and engage um, ongoing counselling, crisis support and safety and mon monitoring in there. We always have to adhere to our existing codes of conduct and especially around um, keeping protocols and ethical frame, um, record keeping protocols and ethical frameworks. There's also good to remind us, especially right now, um, that there might be some limits in terms of what we can offer and what we can't. And be conscious about boundaries. In the document, we did talk about technology, and I just wanted to, um, and we've had lots of questions about this since as well. Um, and so for myself, I'm a little bit of a techno geek. I do love technology. Um, and what we've come to the conclusion is that actually giving guidelines on specific uh, platforms or types of technology isn't actually that useful. It's more useful to point you into 
the direction of reliable sources of information. So the Telehealth Council um, here in Aotearoa is um, they have a very good combination of clinical practitioners and IT um, in particular uh, people that have an understanding of information security experts and they're giving up-to-date information um, even during this time to check different types of platforms and how appropriate they might be. So um, yeah, that's main thing on technology. The rest of the sections of the documents go into making plans, setting expectations, maintaining professional boundaries, limits, risks and informed consent, some general information around practice specific to survivors of sexual violence, and then some, some reflections around COVID-19 and therapy. So I'm just going to stop sharing the screen for a moment. I can see the chat is going really, really full and there's already a question. But did the panelists want to reflect um, on any parts of that document um, to date? Shall I start with maybe Catherine from HELP? Um, hi. Um, yeah, I, I guess I reread it this morning before the webinar just to, um, you know, refresh myself with it again. And really my reflections this morning were that we'll be able to do a much better job of this, um, writing a document like this at the end of this. And so what I'm hoping we'll be able to see is some kind of process by which all of our knowledge can be kind of gathered um, as we move further through this and that we can create a much more um, robust guidelines going forwards that that um, you know that speaks to everybody's kind of situation. Yes, definitely. Um, over to Catherine at start. Um, I suppose as I, as I heard you talking, Miriam, and the, through the process of developing the guidelines, I was really reminded about the value of umbrella bodies like to Nest because I think that when we are um, trying to make sense of our own experience and, and inundated with lots of information from lots of people who are all trying to do helpful things, it's very easy to feel overwhelmed and to switch off or not know who to listen to. Mm -hmm. So I think for someone um, to summarise that and summarise it respectfully and summarise it with knowledge that there are other perspectives around there made, made it so much easier because then at least you've got a place to start. And I think in, in times like this, actually in life in general, to have a place to start and then if I need to go and find something else, um, I've at least got a firm foundation. So um, just, yeah, yeah um, the value of, of what you've done here is, is being really profound. Shane. I guess my only reflection really is that there's a bottom line across all of it, and that's around um, access to good, ethical, safe, clinically sound service. That's also really compassionate. Um, and I think there's something that I really enjoy about the fact that we're modelling what is being written. Um, we're adapting to what needs to be adapted to and to ensure that people have access to the things they need. And I think that's the heartening part of it. Um, yeah, outside of the technical side, there's a real good heart behind that. And it seems that everyone's thinking about the same stuff. Um, so to me, that means we're on the right, on the right trajectory, really. Great, thank you. And we've got a, a reflection that's actually popped through the chat um, to us to us as panelists, which I think is a really um, great live moment of actually being able to kind of reflect on our own practice. So someone was commenting on actually the discomfort around having the poll and uh, wanting us to think about how we're going to actually support those who might have put um, the the red or blue and also some confidentiality statements around that. So the poll was completely confidential, so we can't actually know who said what um, and all of the polls today are confidential. It's one of those things I had in my brain to say when I did the poll and it flipped. Um, so my apologies to the group. But um, I suppose it's a really good thing of just maybe taking a moment and thinking about self-care for um, us as practitioners and where we can get help because I think that's a really um, interesting piece from times when I myself might have needed to find help and we're such a small country that sometimes when we're the professionals we end up with our colleagues or other people that we know and we don't always know where to go and get help um, as professionals so does anyone want to start any reflection around that? Uh, well for me it raises what what we were talking a bit about before the webinar came on about that place for supervision so 
you know, my response to that would be anybody who's up in the red or down in the grey definitely needs to contact, please contact your supervisor today to um, find, you know, start finding a way to move, move into another colour. Um, but that, you know, I'm hoping that that's one of the things that isn't disrupted by COVID-19, that everybody still is having regular supervision. And, and it may be that you need more supervision in this time as you adapt to a different way of doing things and have less kind of on-the-spot peer supervision with colleagues and things. It may be that it's, it's a time to have more. But really, that put your own oxygen mask on first and really needing to take care of ourselves first um, because I, I know it's hard to kind of really take this on sometimes when you're not feeling good, but clients notice when we're not um, in, you know, in that green or yellow kind of space in that diagram. They notice because our face will be less mobile, we'll be less fast in our reaction times to them. Um, we may, you know, find ourselves drifting off thinking about other things and not able to concentrate as much on the client. So. So we do need to be well in ourselves and we need to be well in ourselves to be able to do this work. And just to, to add to that, I think I, I was talking to a supervisor the other day who works for an organisation that has done lots of rhetoric around the importance of self-care, but has also equal to that, if not slightly, slightly privileged, has talked about the need to um, support their clients and to be there for their clients. And, and I think that, that those people who, who end up being in this type of work, we don't tend to do it for the pay, although, you know, tell me where you work if it is. Um, we tend to do it because we care. And we tend to do it because, you know, there, there's, there's um, you know, um, skills and, 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 and drivers in us that, that mean that this is satisfying work. So if given a choice, we tend to put others first. And so that idea of, of workplaces who rhetoric, put rhetoric around, take care of yourselves, for the managers to actually go, no, we actually need to, to, to back that up. You know, we need to be able to say, what does that look like? Actually, what that looks like is actually you don't need to contact clients as frequently as you might. Or our expectations around workload is, are going to actually change, and this is how it's going to change. And potentially to be quite directive around that, because you've got potentially a workforce who do want to help and keep helping. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's about ourselves being assertive about what we need and, and pay attention to what we need for help, but also for people in leadership to go, hey, this is more than just words. We probably need to back it up with some, some directives or some, um, you know, some, some actual changes to practice or expectations that actually allow people to prioritise themselves a little bit. Because we're all in this, you know? Yeah. Just picking up on that, Catherine, um, we have done a lot of work um, on that very thing. It's like, um, and I wrote, I wrote down a few notes about, as a management team, being very, very transparent. Um, very upfront about what our expectations are, but also what the limitations are. So we've set up regular meetings uh, every morning. Everybody's in a, even if it's a 20-minute catch-up meeting. Um, there's been uh, verbal as well as written um, uh, comms to people just saying, actually, you don't have to produce. <laughs> uh, we're not here to produce a whole lot of stuff. And there's sometimes behind the scenes, we sort of feel like if, I, if no one's watching me, I better, I better get on with it. So we've um, made it about just do the best you can with what you've got. Um, expect that the workload might be lower. Uh, we don't expect great levels of production. And I was also mindful too that um, the range of, um, I don't know what word to use, but the age, if you like, of our staff, some, some quite new staff and some sort of old dinosaurs, um, and the newer ones with a little bit of anxiety or even just how do I do this in this space? So we've spent a little bit of time also with, some of our staff um, doing some PD on creating the at-home me, the at-home therapist, how do I do this? So it's all speaking to those little anxieties and concerns that come up. And I think your other point, Catherine, about we have to be in the room um, as ready and, uh, you know, sort of able to respond to the people that we're working with. So it's all about that sort of health and wellness. Um, absolutely critical stuff, eh? Sorry. Just adding to your point about checkups, I think the other thing about being yourself at home is that for some people, to have permission for that, that, that doesn't work for me. Because I think that, that and, and I'm not saying in terms of your organisation, but certainly um, to, to check in with people about what, what, is, what does feel supportive. Because another supervisor commented that actually um, I, I want permission to opt out at times of those check-ins or, or, and, and that, that's actually okay. As long as I've talked to the manager about why and that I'm okay 
actually having some control in, over those sorts of things can also feel useful. Um, but obviously that has to be done in communication because if you're opting out, it could also mean something else. So it needs to be transparently done. And there's a participant um, that's saying, I wonder what, um, I wonder if the colour change, like, considering the colour change, so the colour change brought up quite some interesting discussions, which I'm really enjoying. Um, but she, the person's saying, I wonder what else we need to consider and what other resources we have to address um, without always needing supervision, which I think is a really interesting question. Does anyone um, want to start us off with that? Yeah, I mean, I was just reflecting on that because I read it in the chat as well as what, um, Catherine and Shane have been saying what I was saying before and I'm aware that all of us panelists actually work in organizations mm. and so there's a whole lot of things that we do within organizations to support each other all the time and to check in with each other all the time and I'm aware that not everybody has that privilege you know that people in private practice um, don't have kind of necessarily have a team's you know app set up that they're talking to everybody every day through the day and so that that pulling back to what it is that we all use to um you know whether you have a shared peer suit group or something you know what are the things that support you normally in your work and is there a way to kind of amplify those at the moment um or is there a way to to again make use of the opportunities that working from home gives you that um you might not have otherwise had like um you know maybe you used to go to the cafe for lunch and maybe on a sunny day now you can walk you know through your local bush or something for lunch so so what are the opportunities that are uh, special to this kind of lockdown period but also what are the things that normally support you that you could amplify now people are saying um so 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 such good input so great um i was gonna there aren't many quest other questions coming through so we do have some kind of tangents of questions um, that we've prepared. One of them is really, um, so our, our work is about supporting those impacted by sexual violence. And hearing from you and your organisations, how is COVID-19 impacting the people that you support? Um, and how does, and what are we needing to consider in terms of our own practice um, in supporting them? Do we want to start off with um, Catherine from START? Um. It's a really interesting question because I think that, that um, yeah, there's such individual difference. For a lot of our clients, actually, this has been a blessing. The things that I actually find scary are other people um, or my day-to-day -day, um, expectations that either I place on myself or other people place on me. And so being able to hunker down to a space where I feel safe um, has meant that actually my stress has fallen away. And also something I'm, I'm reminded of from the earthquake being a Cantabrian, is that, that people have talked about this being a shared experience. Because for a lot of the people who have experienced sexual violence, that's such a, a unique and, and um, you know, shame-filled and private experience that no one else gets to know about. And so when I happen to walk down the street post-earthquake or in the current context, and people smile with their eyes and actually are really asking, how are you doing? And it's nice to see you. That, that experience of having of being alongside people in, in a um, in a crisis or in, or in a you know um, a lived experience can feel quite um, uffing and quite quite supportive. The other side of it though is if, if actually being alone with my thoughts or being with people in my home environment um, is too much and actually those people aren't actually safe for me um, and normally the way I keep safety is because I get out of that house and I prepare myself and, and gear myself up to be at home then this COVID-19 experience, um, you know, is going to have those hooks attached to it. I certainly think that the anxiety people held, held pre-lockdown has fallen away a little bit. So the fact that we've done something, we've taken a step towards safety, has meant that um, the risks that people are aligning with, with being infected, um, you know, seems less. But again, one of the, super, um, the therapists was saying the other day that that idea that people are dangerous um, and I need to walk, look out for them has been quite triggering. So, I mean, I'm, I, I could, how long is a piece of string <laughs> in terms of individual difference? But certainly there's been mixed experiences. Um, any of the other two would like to expand or comment more on that? Um, I was just thinking, part of, it, part of the positive side is that it's it's kind of forced us to do the things that we thought we couldn't do or shouldn't do. 
Um, and that's been about finding creativity in the clinical space. It's been about finding creativity in the organizational space so that strength comes for those. Um, also with our clients, it's really interesting because I guess similar to what you're saying, Catherine, there's that anxiety, am I going to get sick? Am I going to die? Who am I going to touch? Who's going to touch me? That kind of stuff. Um, and that anxiety does has tended to fall away in the last few weeks. But we have got people now who are stuck in situations that can either increase risk, um, and that's because they're bored. Um, they might have access to the internet and they are using um, problematic ways of solving that boredom. The other side of it is it also brings people closer into relationship with within the harmful sexual behaviour sector. Relationship is a really key um, factor in, or a key protective factor. So you've got all these things going on at the same time. Um, the other thing I think too for some of our clients, because we've had, I think it's around about 86% of our client base has been able to continue with therapy through either video or telephone, which has been fantastic. Um, and it means that our clients are getting a genuine sense of care. Um, and as you'll be aware, most of our clients are the people who no one likes in the community um, and have a pretty hard time. But having a genuine sense of being approached, um, being cared for, having some interest to see, I think those things in a therapeutic sense have also paid off. So it is both. It's lots of different things. Um, and it's really nice to hold both of those um, together. Um, the things that you need to be careful of and the things that are actually end up being a bit of a blessing. Um, there's a few questions at the moment coming through, unless Catherine has something else you, you would like to add on that. Uh, no, look, I have to admit I've been distracted by the questions in the chat box. <laughs> I, I love your honesty. Um, I, there's a couple of questions around um, that are coming through the chat, which are around clients falling off um, and, this, and the, anxiety, like the anxiousness or trying to figure out how to manage that. Um, and so that what I'm reading from a couple of comments is that tension between uh, attending to the falling off and not wanting to hound people. Maybe we can start with you, um, Catherine, from help and then others can join in. Yes, yes, I, I, I agree that there's been quite a, um, you know, a different, uh, different responses. So for some clients, this has been great and some clients have um, felt more safe and more able to disclose more because of the disconnection that actually telehealth, whether by phone or video, is. Um, some clients have been so anxious about being seen on a screen um, and because often, you know, in these things you can see yourself on the screen, so they become so present, uh, so kind of, um, you know, so caught up with how they look that it can be um, really um, not helpful for them to engage by video. Um, and, you know, in those kinds of situations, I guess I'm one of those people who's been fortunate enough to work alongside a very competent crisis service now for more than 20 years. And so, um, like with our crisis service, they do amazing, incredible work with people on the telephone. And actually, we're always teaching them how to not engage, how to not do therapy, how to keep it to stabilisation and containment while you're on the phone. So, so I came into this with a high level of confidence about what one can do on the phone because of that experience over so much time. So I think that there's something about the way that um, when we reduce our senses, all of us become more... Um, you know, rely on those that we have. And so when you build that kind of cocoon around yourself and you're on the telephone with somebody, you know, who is expressing some of their, their deepest feelings and fears, um, you know, that's as intimate a moment as being in the room in therapy and going through that process. So, so I think that there's some good things that we can do, but not everybody wants to hold this. So the drop-off, um, you know, the drop-off, sometimes I think we know why someone might have dropped off, so we know that they don't have a private space in their home, um, and trying to work that through with them for how they could get some private space. It may be that they can get a smaller period of time for private space, like maybe they can manage 15 minutes with the children in the other room on the screen or something, but, you know, not the full hour. Um, so, so negotiating times. Um, some people, some clients we've had have, are doing this in their cars, and, you know, you go, well, where's your car parked? If it's on the road, it's really public. But if it's down the drive by the house, then maybe that is a place to go where you can, you know, speak freely. Um, I think another issue there was about, you know, not pursuing people too far. And I think that is really an issue in this because we don't want to hound people. We don't want to be 
um, having anyone feel like we're stalking them. So having those kind of, you know, how many times do you try to engage somebody before you stop? And I think that that last one, if, if you can make kind of that decision for yourself with each client as you know them and you're thinking about why they might have disengaged, so long as that last communication to people is always one that says, you know, that, that you hope that they um, come back to talk to you at any point. This is how to contact you, no matter how far out in the future, you know, for them to free to contact you again, um, that they're in your thoughts, um, you know, so that there's always an open door. I think that that's really important. And thank you so much for that, Catherine. I saw some people um, agreeing with you in the chat. Um, unless the other, we're, we're getting quite a few questions. So if there's something um, people want to add, Otherwise, we might move on. But if there's something very important to add, please do. Um, I just wouldn't mind adding that idea of, of um, sometimes what can be quite helpful is sharing that dilemma with the client themselves. Because I think that sometimes we, we're doing a lot of work behind the scenes around, you know, hopefully keeping in mind our formulation of that client and, and what are the things that might be driving them, the thoughts and, and experiences. And we can, we can make decisions for people and kind of go, well, I won't do that because that'll be how they experience it. And... I think, again, that idea of going, hey, if we put the dilemma out there and say, we want you to feel cared for, I want you to feel cared for, but I also don't want you to feel stalked, you know, Matt, that might not be the right use of the word, but so so how am I going to do this in a way that you know I'm here if you need me, but you also can signal to me when you don't? So so I'm not actually telling them what I've decided, I'm, I'm but I'm making that really overt that this is part of one of my drivers, and I think often clients get alongside you on that, and then they can help you come up with a solution that works for them. So putting that dilemma, and it's like sitting beside each other looking at the whiteboard or whatever, that, that can sometimes be quite useful. And I think it's about us also acknowledging there's going to be difference. You know, people have to have space for, for a different approach that's going to work for them. And, um, yeah, anyway, sorry about that. And um, that just uh, prompted me to think um, of something really interesting. Shane and I had a conversation about, about how your organisation structured things with the workers in a really kind of robust way almost to a point that, then the workers are like, that's enough, we don't need as much support. So I'm wondering if we can relate that also to the to how we support each other um, in terms of, you know, if our colleagues drop off, how we do that as well. Maybe, do you want to comment at all on that, Shane? I've chucked you in the deep, um, deep end. <laughs> um, I think the, the key behind it all is, and I think you said it, Catherine, is, is communication. We, we put it out there and we make a really overt statement um, and that certainly happened in, within my teams. We said to each other, we kind of see each other three times a day because of all these organised meetings. Uh, uh, and the organised meetings were good because it kept some structure, but we realised it was just an overkill. We've done the same with clients in, in preparation for uh, movement, moving into level four. Um, all of our clinical staff contacted all of their clients um, to say, you know, we ran a survey, what's the best way to communicate, how often do we need to do that, telephone, video, private space, all of that stuff that we checked out to start with. And I think it seems to me that's, like I say, the key of it is that very, very open, um, transparent conversation about what will this be space look like. Um, and it's brought, I think the good thing is, is it brings out the fact that people are quite resilient in lots of ways, even in the midst of quite strange times. Um, and it brings out their resilience, and in one sense, it brings out that self determination of clients to say, Well, I can't do this, but I can't do that, um, which brings choice back in, which is quite cool. Uh, and our clinicians have to handle that, and <laughs> we have to manage that ourselves. That it's not what's in my formulation, but um, but I can I can move and flex. So, yeah, so I mean, those parallels have been happening across our clinical staff as well as with our clients. Yeah. Great, thank you. So, we've got a few clusters of questions um, that I'm going to try and hopefully pair up and if I um, don't represent them uh, appropriately, please let me know um, participants and we can clarify them. So there's um, one question which is around, there's a lot of focus on individual approaches and what ways of practice, practice, what ways of practice are shifting in terms of how people are accessing information across multiple agencies and whether we need um, support, so whether needing support or being the provider of support. And then also the, the kind of tie into that also, what are we seeing in terms of marginalised groups, for example, disabled rainbow clients and um, survivors who are Māori rainbow clients and other marginalised groups and what barriers might they be seeing? And a reminder to the panelists and to the participants, if there's anything that that's what you don't feel comfortable answering, we can also put questions on pause and try and answer them at a later date. So not wanting to put anyone on the spot. Anyone want to start us off with that one? 
Sorry, I just I'll, I'll I'll throw something in. I um particularly thinking of working with Māori clients, um, and we have a, um, a Māori cultural clinical supervisor um, who works with us. And what we've done is we've ramped up a whole lot of um, uh, supervision sessions, essentially. So we've got groups from work who are in those supervision sessions, and then looking at what does it mean um, with particular particularly with Māori, what does it mean when um, kanohi te kanohi, te kanohi is actually really critical and all of a sudden we're screen to screen um, or ear to ear. And um, so she's been supporting our staff um, to understand what that might look like and to also bring out things like how do you use your voice? Um, how do you use your tone? Um, what does that mean in the clinical space? It's not just necessarily about the words, but it's also about the approach and about the, uh, the empathy that's spoken and unspoken. Um, that's just one, and we also have, sorry, another person who's working with uh, a bunch of our staff who are working with Pacific clients. Um, so the same kind of approach around what does that mean for someone who's embedded within Whaasamoa, for example? Um, what does that mean for them? So we're getting a lot of uh, assistance and support to meet the needs of clients who would otherwise be marginalised. Yeah. Hopefully that's of some help. Anyone else want to add anything on those kind of individual approaches, marginalised communities, accessing support? I mean, I suppose what comes to mind is often our clients are in that space anyway. So, you know, this is adding another layer to that. And, um, you know, so exactly what you're saying, Shane, is, is, is seeking support, is being open and transparent in communication, letting them know um, that you're a bit stuck and when you might need to go and get some help to know how to do this. Um, because again, it's that, that idea of sharing this, you, you don't want to share it so much that in fact they don't think you're helpful and that you're a, you're a safe set of shoulders that they can kind of put some bar you know, burden on, but you also don't want to be putting yourself forward in a position to say, I've got all the answers. So I think that idea of, of, of asking them what they're needing, of utilising social workers in your team, for example, if they're a you know, good old Maslow's hierarchy. And I suppose what we could put in Maslow's hierarchy is the internet, you know, and, and kind of, you know, cell phone coverage and, um, you know, Spark, you know, there's some great deals around about trying to help people be accessible. Um, and so we're having to be flexible around what, what those needs might be. Um, but we don't have to be the holder of all that knowledge. So to, 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 que to question and, and, and have conversations with the client, but also, as you say, seek, seek out um, consultation with others who may know more. Um, yeah, I think that's how we traverse this this story all the time, and and and, and this is going to be the same, isn't it? Hey, the next round of questions is all around um, understanding PTSD and like what kind of what kind of strategies can we use? Um, so one one question that wraps up quite a few of them well is so much of the therapeutic work with sexual abuse survivors includes holding. Um, involves holding within co-regulated safe emotional space within a window of to tolerance. Is it ethical to continue to do this kind of work on telehealth platform without any physical proximity? How um, have others who continue to address traumatic content found continuing to provide this on telehealth platform? Um, we'll start with Catherine at help and then I think it will be useful to actually get all three of you to answer this one because it's quite a meaty one. Thanks, uh, Miriam, and thanks for that question. Yes, so we have um, found this moving over time, I have to say. So our intention when we went when we went into this place was, and our guidance to staff was that it was a stabilisation and containment phase, kind of back to, you know, stage one trauma therapy, um, to assist people to stabilise in the midst of their own adjustments to lockdown, but also to not be going into that kind of, um, you know, difficult processing place where that, that you know, human energy between two people is so important where you can really know how somebody's leaving your room at the end of that session. So that was our, our place to start with. And that's moved over the weeks um, in response to what our therapists tell us is happening with their clients. So there are a, a quite a proportion, I guess, I, I'm not sure of the exact proportion, but quite a proportion who actually feel more able to do that processing work now, who feel more safe because they're at home, because they don't have to leave the therapy session, go and catch a bus in a public space to get home. Um, 
people tends to be people who have a fair amount of control over their home environment so they can retreat to a room they do know that their children or their partners or their parents are not going to come into that room um, so those people your people in that situation some of them are wanting to progress the therapy and are progressing it more and I think that this is those tight ropes that we have too because you know Sometimes there's that line between, yes, the client wants to progress because it's really, um, you know, emotionally big for them at the moment, but we're not sure they're safe, so we, we're not wanting to go there with them, you know. So negotiating, as Catherine says, you know, really negotiating whether now is the time is just as important and working with them before, the same as you would have done in the room, like setting up what is it that they'll do after the session, how will they care for themselves afterwards, those might be different now from what they would normally do, but you know, going through all of those safety things that you normally would, and um, having that backup that we do have 24-7 phone lines now available that if, if people do become triggered after the session that they can still get help um, to to um, manage that kind of in this situation so so yeah so we've changed over time we were kind of like no don't do that work now we're like mm, yes it's an opportunity um, but proceed with care and renegotiate constantly great we'll go to Shane thank you so much for that um, answer it gave a really good comprehensive um, overview maybe Shane do you have anything to add I guess just the same sort of considerations. When I was reading our um, our policy that we had written and, and guidelines that we have, and it is around again, it's that thing. From the very beginning, we start to assess what that situation might be like. Uh, we know who the client is. We know um, the things that might increase levels of risk, and that's risk to self or risk to others or risk of dysregulation. Um, and I guess the clinicians will go into that space having that conversation to start with. So it's all about the preparation, it seems to me, and I think, Catherine, I like your point that I think once upon a time we were really afraid of it, and we're less afraid of it, but we're very mindful of it, um, and we're very human about it, and we can approach people and afford them that um, that they they have some capacity to cope or some capacity to speak about it. And at the end of the day, we, we can't control everything, um, and that's one of those things that we, we hold as clinical um, people as well. It's like sometimes things are disgusting. Um, I thought one thought I had was that with the limited uh, physical and social space that people have now, um, they are at least within that limited environment before and after the therapy. So one of the things that we've done with um, particularly younger clients and children is making sure that they have so the adult who supports them, the adult who knows about them being it safe can also be part of that conversation um, to ensure that that support sits there before, during and after, even if they're not in the room. Um, we can involve them in that wider picture. Yeah. Catherine from Start. Um, I mean, I think that, that both those responses are really, really um, thorough. There's a couple of things I'd add is, is um, as I listen to the therapist from Start talk, what I'm aware of is a, a number of them are actually saying that it's, it's amazing how you can create a sense where your nervous systems are still talking to each other online. So yes, I might not be, um, you know, clearly two metres away from each other as we <laughs> in current speak. But, you know, I may not be in the room with you, but actually if I'm attending to some things inside my own body, then some of those same kind of factors are actually communicating themselves online. Um, and that actually makes me think, in addition to all the things you've said about client care, we've also got to really keep our lens on, on therapist care because, you know, the clients aren't the only ones going from that experience into their own spaces. We are doing that too. So, you know, again, our, our professional boundaries around what we talk about and, and, and all those other sorts of things might be absolutely spot on. But normally, most of us go to work and come home and there's some boundaries there around the type of work we're doing. And we don't typically do it in our own office or in our own bedroom or in our own lounge room. So I think sometimes if you're feeling as a therapist that in actual fact, I'm not up for this, then actually that's an okay, it's a really important piece of data for you to be paying attention to too. You know, if you're actually um, titrating what the client's processing because actually you're aware that you're um, carrying a bit too much or that this doesn't feel as okay for you to be doing in this environment, um, you know, if that's all the time, then again, you might need to attend to that. But if actually just aware that mm, I'm not so good today and, and actually I don't have a space to go and debrief about this or I don't want to do this with this person now, 
um, that's okay too to give yourself permission to do that. So yeah, I just think that that idea of our own self-care around processing, because we scratch the underbelly in this job, you know, and, and sometimes that feels okay to be doing somewhere else, but not at home. So there was just a follow-up question to that, um, which is, are you speaking to projective identification? Um, I mean, whatever language people are putting on around, I mean, I think there are different languages that people may well put on therapeutically around that experience. Um, I absolutely think that, that we are able to pick up on um, not only bodily sensations, but um, cognitions and thoughts and feelings that are in the interplay between ourselves and the client. So um, my sense is that people, it might be different how they're doing that, but that actually the screen doesn't stop that. Mm. So, you know, it, it, it certainly needs um, focused attention. Yeah, great. Thank you. And there's someone commenting also that it's still possible to invite wider into a session. I think um, I I'm, don't do telehealth, but I do a lot of facilitation online through Zooms. And I was saying, mentioning that the other day of um, that very similar process. You can still feel the group, even though you're through a screen. Um, there's definitely some information that might be missing, but, you know, there's, you can use other elements, whatever spiritual practice works for you, is, is part of you, but also there, there is some other communication happening and it's also part of the exhaustion. So some of the stuff we've um, been reading up on in terms of Zoom and Zoom exhaustion is our brains are trying to compensate for the pieces of information we're missing that usually happen face to face live, um, which I think is also really interesting of um, noticing that in ourselves and noticing um, I've been hearing lots of people across the sector going, it's a lot more tiring um, than being alive in the face for someone. We've got a few questions around safety, which um, and we only have 10 minutes left. And I know there's a lot of um, a lot of uh, great questions still coming through uh, and some people are needing to go. So just um, I, there was a couple of questions I'll just answer live that, yes, these, this will is being recorded and it will be available on YouTube afterwards. Um, so if you do need to drop off, um, pop off earlier, that's fine. Um, so there's a few questions around safety. And so um, kind of going back similar to what we were saying before, um, the three of you and, and my experience is mostly working in organisations. So safety is um, and how we manage safety, and especially if organisations already have crisis uh, teams um, or sexual violence crisis teams, that that's all part of the picture. Um, but if someone has transitioned from um, private practice to telehealth, what are some core safety things um, that, well, safety mechanisms that will support the practitioners right now, do you think? So I start with um, uh, Catherine from Help because we've got a quite well-established uh, crisis team that work alongside your therapeutic team. Uh, yes. Can you be a little more specific, Miriam? Safety is such a big, wide um, area. Is there a more specific question in there that um, we could address? Yeah, so the, that's thank you for um, asking that. How are people managing risk of being harm disclosed in therapy, especially if it's just through the phone with no visual clues? Silence and distress levels can be harder to assess, and engagement with risk harder to support. Yes, <laughs> yes. So there are less um, there are less cues there, um, but um, but there also is still quite a lot of information. So, you know, being able to still attune to the client that you're with, you know, we use our own um, sense of being with someone to really assess their safety often. And we will ask all those questions, but actually it's that sense you have that, yes, they are, uh, you know, you are confident that they're safe or, or not. Um, and so we still have those, um, that attunement is still there. Our, our mirror neurons are still there and working regardless of what, um, you know, whether we only have hearing um, available to us or, or sight as well on the video. So, so, um, so we have, oh, I guess for me, the biggest tool we have in our safety toolbox is ourselves as a therapist and we still have that tool. Um, the tools, well, we still have most of the tools, actually. That's where I'm going to go with that. We still have most of the tools because we have ourselves and our sensing of that. We have our relationship with the client. We have our knowledge of the client's context. And, um, you know, if you're a few sessions in, you'll have some knowledge of what their worst triggers are. So really, really, most of it's kind of the same to me. 
most of it is the same. So the bits that are, are different, um, and again, this sorry, just thinking this as I go, what, what's, what's, uh, if it's a client you're used to working with, most of it's the same. I think if it's if it's a new client that you're picking up, say on the telephone, I think that that can be more difficult. Um, but the same things kind of apply. You know, like people come to this work. I don't know about harmful sexual behaviour, but certainly survivors come to this work usually in a state of of or close to readiness to get on with something because you don't make this decision to come to therapy for the impacts of sexual violence lightly. It's not on anybody's, you know, New Year's list of all things I'll do. Most people come because their defences have fallen over in some way and they're not able to cope anymore. So most people come really wanting to engage to get some help. Now that that trust barrier is there for, you know, many, many of our clients because they've been harmed by another human being. So, so it's not easy for them to reach out for that help. But that rapport building that we do generally means that most people will engage quite quickly. And it's that engagement, that relationship, building that relationship up in the ways that we always do, you know, that provides the most safety for that work going forwards. Right, thank you. Um, Shane, would you want to go next? Oh, look, I just had a thought as you're speaking, Catherine. Um, I love that kind of picture of that we, we kind of know how we work. We know our clients often. The other thing that struck me is that in that moment of negotiation with our clients, from maybe it's from session to session, is sometimes it might be um, quite safe and okay and we've negotiated the space to go into a much more um, affective level. And other times it might be a more psychoeducational level, and so we hit it from a more of a cerebral sort of place. And that's also part of that, I don't know how you say it, but it's a knowing, it's a, it's a space that we get into as therapy people, um, who are people people. But I think we can do that overtly with our clients, um, very upfront, with permission, um, navigating our way into a space. And it might just be the best time to do something very cerebral, very CBT, um, this, 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 and then the next time we might go into a more affective space. Um, but we can negotiate the safety around that space to start with. And again, we're never going to get it right all the time. And I guess there's those, and making sure those avenues are set up to start with around, can we contact you if, can you contact us if, um, and hopefully providing those pathways. And every human being will choose. Um, but I, I agree that there, there is a lot of safety there. Um, and I think by being afraid, we bring fear into the room. Um, by being um, confident and open and, in a sense, humble about our humanity, we also bring courage into the room. Um, hopefully those will also create avenues as well. Thank you. Catherine? Um, I mean, I think you guys have, have, have covered the really important points. And, and I suppose as I heard you talking, Shane, you know, what I'm reminded of is, is this issue of control, hey, is that, that no matter how beautifully we do a risk assessment and how wonderful our, our um, you know, safety plan is, people still have choice. And, and I think one of the most uncomfortable things we sit with as therapists or human beings is the idea that we can't control someone else's behavior, no matter how much we'd like to, we can't keep someone safe. So I think a lot of what you're talking about is our own anxiety. Um, and you know, to, to make sure you've got backup, to make sure you've done as much as you possibly can. But sitting alongside that is also, we're sitting with a lack of control and possibly what this current situation is, is bursting our bubble a little bit, is we possibly have less control than we think we do. You know, but, but normally we have some things that, that um, scaffold that to kind of build up that, that delusion. Um, and so I think, yeah, just stuffing everything you're saying and, and, and realizing that often that's our own anxiety and we can only just do the best we can. And if it comes from care and with compassion and, and, and trying to be as competent as possible and thorough, you know, that's all we can do. Right, thank you. I'm going to um, quickly answer a couple of questions that have come through. So uh, we will try and send out, there are some trainings on telehealth that we have found um, and we've shared them within our sector. So we'll dig out the links and when we send out the PowerPoint, we'll send those um, links as well. Um, we have a really interesting question, which I'll just answer quickly. Is it helpful to think about how our clients can think through aftercare and um, getting to the session. So I've shared with um, my colleagues that I'm actually in therapy because I'm studying psychotherapy and one, and so I'm, I'm being in telehealth therapy. So I've had to do this transition as a client. And one thing I noticed was actually I um, needed to create my ritual of usually you commute to your therapist and 
then you're in the waiting room and that's when I get rid of my busy day and actually bring myself present. So I've needed to schedule that in because with work, I can kind of have back to back Zoom meetings until my next meeting is my therapy meeting. Um, so just kind of thinking that through even with your clients and going, have you thought through how you're coming here, how you're arriving here, what's the difference? Having that conversation is really useful. And same for us as practitioners in terms of work, like I've worked from home for a while, having that, how do I commute to work and how do I commute away from work, even though I'm in the same house? So uh, shifting those rituals and that, um, I, I really liked what Shane said before, being mindful of you know, being present now in the here and now, I'm actually stopping work and I need to, whatever works for you, sometimes that space that you're working in is the same as other spaces, but that you've ritualized it, that it's closed for work and it starts a new space. So I thought I'd just um, quickly answer. So in terms of other types of communications, snail mail and email, I would, and um, please panelists feel, feel free, but um, you know, my suggestion is experimental, like within the boundaries of safety, experiment a little bit. If your client prefers writing a letter to you, um, snail mail is very snail mail these days. I had to do some snail correspondence last year and it can take quite a delay. But if that's a way that works for that person and it's therapeutically, it feels therapeutically good for them, go for it um, and reflect together and create that partnership together. Um, so the last one I thought would be really nice and we're running out of time. So if the panel's okay going with one question, um, which I thought was quite a nice transitioning um, to the end of this. So someone um, writes, I find myself wondering how, the, how we best transition clients back to face-to-face -face sessions when this time comes. Probably not any time soon, particularly those that feel staying, at ho uh, feel staying home. I've appreciated ACC's flexibility um, through this time and hope this will continue. So I suppose that, um, I would expand the question, how do we transition our clients and how do we transition ourselves back? Um, to face to face. So maybe um, Shane, do you want to start us off and we'll hear from all three of you and that will be our last question. We are saving all the questions. Thank you so much and we'll close after all of you have responded. Um, so we, I guess we did it at both ends. We did a how, how do we transition to non face to face uh, and that was done through consultation with our clients uh, through questionnaires and we'll do the same when we go back again. So there will be a time, because we'll be aware of the time that we have to go back to work. So when it gets to level two or whatever it is, um, then we can have a week or two to say, at this such a time, we'll be back at work face to face and we'll start that conversation again. So it's similar to the, the video space. How do we bring ourselves into that? So it's about communication with clients. Uh, it's about checking that everything's okay transport wise, just the practicalities and logistics of being in our space. Um, and also maybe some reassurance around um, our hygiene and cleanliness that you know we'll be wiping our door handles down and and bringing the sort of the, the, the sort of the phase out of, of the COVID stuff um, into reality so being again being really transparent uh, almost like plonking along but that seems to me that the, the best way we can do that. Um, we'll go to Catherine at start and then Catherine at help. Um, I mean I'm thinking you probably need another webinar <laughs> in terms of this topic because you know, I think that, that yeah, it, it certainly is an interesting clinical um, and, and, and human issue because we're all in this boat together, hey? I noticed that the, the night before, you know, Jacinda or the government made that announcement, I, I found myself getting a little bit anxious about how I was going to step back into the busyness of life. Now, you know, I've got a good life and, and actually those busy things are really nice things, but I found that really, really visceral experience of, oh, oh, I've adjusted and now I'm going to have to get used to something else. So, even normalizing to people that that getting back to normal isn't going to feel like woohoo, it's going to be weird and, and there's going to be a transition phase to it. I think the other thing too can be, I suppose I don't know what people's particular bent with regard to this in therapy is, but certainly a number of therapeutic processes will always keep the idea that this relationship is going to come to an end at some point in the room. Now that might not be overt, but that the frame is that this isn't ongoing and forever. So whether or not therapeutically you're talking about, hey, we're doing this at the moment for the bubble, um, and that, that when this finishes, there's going to be this. So, so that we're not just kind of diving into here and now and just being you, you know, um, singularly focused on that. We've always got the exit from the bubble in our minds, whether it's conscious or in the room, um, can also be really helpful. 
Um, so I guess I'd just add to that my hopes that actually funders and services will be more flexible going forwards so that, you know, that we've learned from this. And for some clients, it's actually definitely helpful. Some clients who don't need to get four kids on two buses to get to therapy, you know, it's definitely helpful to be able to do it in a different way. So my hope is that we will go back to something different where we are negotiating more telehealth um, kind of in what we do. Um, and the other thing um, just that I think I haven't heard from the other two that I'll just add is that some of my colleagues were really happy to be working from home to start with, you know, and that was good. But actually, by the beginning of this week, they were like, oh, my God, can't wait to be back and see people and actually be able to touch, you know, a human being outside my bubble and, and you know, share those other rituals that we have that are in-person rituals so, so I think that, yes, there's a degree of comfort developed with this, but there's also some of us who are wanting to get back to um, not a normality in terms of Auckland traffic, certainly not that, but a normality in terms of being able to really connect well with other people. So I think that transition will be different for us all, depending on where we are in those kind of um, comforts and places. But my hope is that going forward, we will, we will embrace a more flexible world. And what a what a really great um, tone to end on in terms of the the hope and possibility, the acknowledgement of the journey, and um, and how we all move through this together. And so, um, firstly, I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us today. We had um, anywhere between two hundred and one hundred and fifty eight people um, at any one time today. So that to me says that there was a lot of need for connection and a lot of need for us to be having these conversations and I've loved the comments in the chat and um, hopefully we can keep these conversations going. Um, thank you to all three of you for your time and um, and your sharing your wisdom and knowledge. Thank you for those who have also shared wisdom and knowledge. I've enjoyed seeing how much you've been giving each other tips and tricks and, um, and being sharing your own um, resourcefulness and experience. Um, so we will end today um, and hopefully we'll be back soon. And if you do, we will be receiving an email with the slides, but also with a feedback so you can let us know what other sessions you would like. So kakite anō, go well in all of your bubbles, look after yourselves, look after each other, and hopefully we will get out of this situation soon. Kia ora. Kia ora.